uh, in the thanks uh, extension. And um, I am now transitioning to be product manager for the new multimedia team.
technical skills in order to be able to work with the developer, and because you're working on software, you're building features. Um, you're supposed to have user experience and design skills in order to collaborate with designers to um, have design input on the product, and you're supposed to have business skills. So a lot of product managers are actually starting out as like MBAs or business people or engineers. And I think one of the things that's different and so much like more interesting about Wikimedia as a movement and about what we do with, for the movement is that we throw out the business part of that and we add community and we add data as things that we do. Um, obviously, you could sort of throw in community relations and outreach research <coughs> under the sort of UX and design banner. Um, and I thought about doing, like sort of making that claim as a part of this panel, but I think it's more fair to say that unlike, say, a startup which views design as we're doing design work to sort of invent this idea for a theoretical group of users who don't exist yet, or a theoretical group of people who are going to buy our software. We have a huge community of people who are out there and like we can interact with in a really direct way. I, as I view uh, our role as product managers, I think one of the key things that we're responsible for is, in many cases, delivering a user experience that will help people be more productive. Uh, it's not all of the cases, but a lot of what we do is help create software tools that help people, enable people to do things uh, uh, better. And um, often, one of the roles of the product manager is to reach out to users, and there's many different user groups, and so you really have to reach out uh, to a, a variety of uh, people, try to find out what their needs are, and try to see if there's a way to define a product that could potentially address those needs. But the way we uh, create this definition of the product is we don't do it in isolation. We do it with a team and with the community. And more and more, when we're able to, to, to articulate this definition in a collaborative setting, um, it's, it's very effective. So we drive the conversations, and then we try to synthesize the results of these conversations, turn them into very specific feature requirements and product plans, and then help uh, nudge the team along to actually implement the software tool that will deliver that experience. Um, so I um, thought it might be good to give an example of maybe a product that you guys worked on um, and talk about the name of the product that you And 
that's the bad decision. That's the one decision you can't make as a product manager. You're a shark. You have to keep moving, and then you get skewed and die. <laughs> 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 uh, you have to keep making decisions and uh, then remaking them and being open to change and helping other people um, uh, make those decisions with you rather than come up with some grand plan of the, the designers to walk to the room for a month and then we have the perfect plan for the next few years. I think I have a, a related uh, product experience uh, with building out the local website of Wikipedia. Um, so we were kind of tasked with taking Wikipedia and, and making it a mobile experience, right? So you ask uh, the editors of Wikipedia, what would you like uh, Wikipedia to look like? They would probably say, well, just take Wikipedia readers what they want on Google Media. They don't want any of that. They don't want any of the sidebar. They don't want any of the weird extra stuff. They just want to read their content. Um, so figuring out which of those audiences to target, which of those audiences to go for, which of the five bajillion features that we have on the desktop site um, actually makes sense on a tiny, tiny screen that you hold into your hand when you're riding on the bus, um, if it makes any sense, um, that's kind of a, a challenge. <laughs> Um, and it's not something that sort of, you know, I sat down and said, well, I'll just I'll have this and that. Um, it, it really requires a lot of, kind of data work. It requires a lot of community work. It requires a lot of just decision making um, that might be kind of arbitrary, but that you can recalibrate um, and kind of change as you go. Um, so building features is not something that we do in like a chiseled tablets kind of way. Um, we're always looking to uh, reorient our direction and if we can see that we're going down a bad path, we have to kind of maintain this ability to change uh, and go on a different path and um, stop working on the and work on something else. Um, and if you, if you just have designers and engineers working together, uh, you, you get a lot of really, really good kind of inertia going in one direction. Um, but often it's very difficult to sort of move that into a new direction when you suddenly realize, well, we put uploads on yeah, and 7,000 people uploaded a selfie. Um, great, <laughs> what do we do now? Um, so I think the, the role of product management there really is um, to be able to catch that situation that's bad, um, we're not working, uh, or it needs to be working in a different way, and to kind of take the reins of this quickly moving, uh, you know, basically wagon, and uh, steer it into a new direction. Um, so. <laughs> right there. Yes, to follow up on both of Mariana and Kobe. So, on the one hand, you are, you're, you're proxying your customers' wishes, right? You talk a lot to your customer stakeholders, you pick into the reads of what they want. And if you are lucky, then everybody wants the same thing, and it highly simplifies your life. <laughs> Usually, that's not the case, so you also have to kind of negotiate between different stakeholders on what is, what is the most important feature. And on the other hand, it's very important to, to manage the scope of the product and have a release plan, right? You cannot, version 1.0 cannot be all, right? So you have to, as you call it, a uh, minimum viable product, I think one of us use that terminology quite regularly, like what's the minimum specific reach that we can actually launch and, um, and what are we going to do next? Uh, and it is, it is this constant negotiation that's going on, and I think what Stephen said in the beginning, we don't have a lot of authority, and that's very true. It's a lot of soft, soft skills. We, it's really about negotiating, communicating, uh, demonstrating. I think those are the key skills uh, that you need um, uh, to show like, where the product is, where you want the product to go, based on all the input that people are talking about. So I think one of the more interesting points about the job is uh, obviously the Wikimedia movement and the foundation has not always had our managers, and that's because we're not actually required to build a piece of software and that obviously um, you can have a feature like say watch lists or pending changes or flag revisions where the developers and the community or the developers and the designer and the community like talk directly to each other and the reason why we stepped into that process is to help people negotiate that process efficiently without having to feel, without making engineers and designers feel like 
they can't do their job because they're constantly having feedback and um, like different balanced priorities being thrown at them. Um, and to like help steer a really clear vision about who a feature is for um, and, and why we need it. Um, usually that doesn't involve just involve talking to people, but it also involves looking at data about who uses a feature, what other similar products on the web do um, the same notifications, that kind of thing. Yeah, let's if you have questions, like we can just stop it. There are a few tools that are available. Uh, you know, first, you could actually go to a new user 
uh, that you know and just say, hey, uh, would you mind just spending five minutes and uh, just looking at the screen, and here's a particular task, how would you go about doing that? And in just a few minutes, you can find out right away where there's a problem. Uh, there are other ways where you actually use some surveys uh, that the, the readers might fill in and you can actually get a little bit of a glimpse of that. But you can also do some observations. Like for example, when we were doing notifications, we observed that there were a lot of um, negative feedback given to new users, like your uh, reverting edits or uh, you know, uh, please don't do that, messages on your talk pages, warnings. But there was absolutely no positive feedback that we could find that kind of counterbalance all this negative feedback. And so that led us to propose a thanks feature where you could just click on the little thanks button next to your uh, edits to thank someone for an edit. And that was in some ways common sense. It wasn't driven by you know, lots of data coming in. And we did talk to a few users. But you could see that there was a void there that could be filled with a feature. Um, so there are really a, a variety of different ways to be able to understand what we do from perspective. But the best way really is to try to look uh, through the eyes of another user if you can have that conversation. Yeah, I think the answer is basically to force yourself to do that. So like, if we're redesigning the watch list, one seemingly perfectly valid way of doing that is we could all go look at our watch list with like 500 or 5,000 articles in them, think about what we don't like about them, ask other power editors what they think about it, start a wiki page about it, and write a blog post and have an IRC discussion about it. And then the other way is we could sign up for a fresh account and see what a blank watch list looks like through the eyes of someone who's never seen one before, run like remote or in-person usability tests, actually ask people to try the thing out and see what their reaction is. Um, but it's not rocket science in that sense, but like, basically just to force yourself to do it. What I mentioned, put on top, we need to get more questions. Yeah. And keep the answers shorter, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I'm a software developer at the foundation, and, and um, I've worked closely with both you, Stephen, and with Mariam, and, and, and with uh, Howie, too. And uh, one of the things I think about is, um, I feel that it's a very productive relationship and that it ends up making my work um, more significant um, and, I, and that I derive a lot of benefit from it. And so one of the things I think about is how do you sell this kind of relationship to um, developers that are more skeptical of it? And um, when you started out, Stephen, you said, we don't manage programmers, we don't tell them what and I think that while that's superficially true, that may be a little bit simplistic because there is a sense of accountability that comes with being the person who represents the rest of the team, um, the interests of you know, the board or users and so on. And the risk you run telling people we don't have programmers about tell them what to do is to get the response, no way am I falling for that one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, not, not so much a question as a spur for you to specify that more. Well, my program is tell me that I'm telling them what to do, and I tell them that I'm not, and that they are autonomous, and that they should do <laughs> what they think is right, but that I would advise a certain thing. I would say that product management and um, development engineering and design and data and community liaison um, should all work together as partnership. And you can often mistake the fact that the product manager's job is to be the pivot through which the others act as saying that the product manager is in charge. And it's not that the product manager is in charge, but it's their job to help each of the others talk to each other and explain um, their reasoning. You know. It's sort of like a closing admin on Wikipedia. You know, that person is not responsible for like making that. the decision. They're responsible for kind of taking that long discussion, looking at everybody's arguments for or against whatever, and finally, ultimately, turning that into one coherent course of action. Yeah, I think that's a really good analogy because like when a discussion is closed on Wikipedia, you you know that the, that person has in some sense an enormous amount of power to like sort of finalize the consensus or whatever, but in some sense they really don't because what their summary like has to be is actually a result of all the feedback that came in and balancing all those things. And if it isn't, then people are going to be really pissed about it. I think there's one additional quality to it and that is that where the discussion on Wikipedia is mostly not time-boxed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the time to discuss is not limited. We 
we are actually also responsible for saying to our stakeholders, you have X time to get to something. And even though I don't really want to, because I make worse choices than you do, if you don't reach a decision by the end of the time, I'm actually being forced to make Because we have to be going forward. A lot of the work, too, is asking the right questions. Knowing what is the question that you basically want to engage the team in the community to answer. Uh, and then based on the answers to these questions, doing this process of synthesis, where you say, okay, we've heard a lot of things from you all. Let me see if I can synthesize all this into a concrete plan, a concrete set of instructions. And if you guys are okay with it, absolutely yes. Um, and that's an important role. So we're not ultimate decision makers, but we do decide what questions to ask and how to synthesize. Yeah, I was wondering if you could, some of you could give an example of uh, when you've made a decision and then you had to flexibly change on that decision or any regrets you've had. <laughs> we have regrets every day. Yeah, but name specific ones. Because well, for me, I there was a, a really big issue with uh, when we released notifications, we changed uh, what is affectionately called the orange bar of doom which was a big orange bar, which many of you are familiar with, that used to appear almost like in the middle of the article page, and which <coughs> violated many uh, user interface conventions. It just didn't seem like the right way to do things. We thought we could do something more effective with the notification system. But the community felt very strongly that this uh, uh, you know, was not the right thing to do. And uh, it was uh, they wanted us to put it back in, and we felt it wasn't right to put it back in. So, the way we resolved this uh, was to actually go on an IRC channel with the designer of Giba, the developer Kaldari, myself, and, and a, a few community members, and to basically invite people to help in real time actually try to brainstorm a solution. This was after having had a talk page where many different options had been considered for a period of time, but the actual resolution took place, and this was actually absolutely wonderful, to basically have the team and the community reach a decision together uh, in a live format. And we created the orange bar of love, which is a much bigger <laughs> orange bar that still uh, addressed the request from the community, but didn't do it in a way that we thought would uh, hurt the um, I'll give a really quick example. So we redid the account creation and login pages in media wiki across all the sites. And when we, before we actually like made the finalized redesign, we ran comparative A-B tests with brand new people who were signing up to see which version made it easier for them. And the really clear winner was a version in which we built some JavaScript functions that told you before you even had to click the submit button whether your username was available, whether your passwords matched each other, whether your email was entered, entered in correctly, like really obvious thing to do. Um, and the truth is we had sort of tested a very, very basic version of that. And then at the end of the thing, we came back and we said, well, how long would it take to actually build a version of this in MediaWiki core? And the answer was way too long for how much time we actually had allocated to work on this project. And we had to make a compromise where we did the rest of our redesign that was clearly still beneficial to users in compared to the old version, but we weren't able to put in like the, actual, the absolute like rock star version of it that I really would have loved to have released, and I think everybody else would have too. Um, and of course, it's the kind of thing you can revisit again in the future, but like weighing against time is another big trade-off like that. Like, it really sucks to have to work on a marathon project that goes on like more than six months or a year like that. It's really bad for everybody. Yeah, I think that's of some of the biggest um, challenges. I guess some of you had product management background coming from other places and coming here. And that contrast and what some of the challenges here, um, if any. Um, I'll jump in. So uh, my most immediate previous experience was running, um, uh, building and running a new government website in the UK for open data. Um, so I had quite a large budget and quite a large team and I was kind of personally directly responsible for it. Um, which is much more in the kind of management, director, in charge, I have staff, I can sack staff um, kind of role. And um, that wasn't necessarily a better place to be. I mean, according to my CV, I was more senior than I am at the foundation. I was in charge. I had a budget. 
but um, I think that often um, trying to do product management in the context of being the person with money is a mistake. It's um, a mistake because it forces you um, to not extemporize your decisions. You don't go to someone else and say, so these are the things I would like to do with the product, please give more resource. You just say, well, it's my money and I'm deciding I'm doing this and not this. And you never have that conversation with anyone else. And um, at the foundation, because we've split uh, budget control from product control, I think that works really well. Um, at the foundation, I don't have a budget. Visual editor does not have a budget. It's split between different teams in design, in product, in engineering. And that means that it's much more about, as um, we've said, it's about uh, uh, explaining the justification for your product and um, talking through why you think uh, something should go one way or the other and justifying yourself on a continual basis. And I think that's a much healthier way of doing it. I'd like to understand more about how you avoid, a, I mean, there's, there's seven of you on seven different projects, right? How do you avoid collisions and scope? And also, how do you avoid collisions and conflicting requirements put on developers which are <coughs> fundamentally going down the same place? Um, <coughs> 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 so we talk to each other. That's basically the major way. Uh, I mean, for example, there's stuff the visual editor with the data. So definitely interact more. Uh, Jim and I use every chance uh, to meet with each other, talk with each other. We, we meet at 6 o'clock in the morning in San Francisco. Our role is to be the synthesizer of the different out, uh, in any way. This is exactly the place um, where we can try to avoid this and try to accommodate the different um, wishes that we have. We talk to each other and, and we write it down. Like that's what a roadmap is supposed to be for the for the media wiki as a, as a community and the WMF as an organization so on a yearly basis. That's a regular formalized thing, or that's just informal. I mean, both. It varies sort of. between teams. Yeah. We we talk to each other on a regular basis. Um, the question is of how much teams have a like formal roadmap um, differs. But I would also say that part of our job as product manager, um, possibly more than anyone else, sorry Eric, anyone else at the foundation is to understand what's going on in all the other teams, to understand whether or not they're going to clash with each other. An engineer's job is to write great code and improve the existing code. And um, if they also happen to know three other different teams doing similar stuff, that's a great opportunity. But actually, it's my job uh, to hook together Visual Editor with something being done in platform engineering to improve JavaScript performance, or something being done in language team to work better with different platforms, whatever that is. That's my job as product manager. And um, hopefully, we don't screw it up too often. There's another question you have to talk about? Yeah. Okay. How much uh, technical? or design background do you think you need to be an effective product manager? Is a lack of it a weakness? Is having it a strength? I think the, the, the answer to that question is that there are so many skills that a good product manager might need um, in general and specifically within the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, like really solid uh, tech chops is one um, and really, really good eye for design is another. Um, but there are other skills like um, really being able to work with data, um, being able to understand the community, um, having sort of uh, a presence in the community itself um, that are equally important. Uh, so I think the, the way that we kind of approach it is we all have our 1% skill, um, which I'm actually, I should talk about it now because I don't know if I can actually find that. But uh, yeah, go. So. Um, sure. Um, so I think to answer your question correctly, um, First, uh, there is a minimum level of technical, technical understanding that every product manager needs to have. Right? You want, um, fundamentally, a technical product, um, so if you don't understand how uh, those types of things work, it's going to be really hard um, as a position. Um, um, but kind of having said that, um, one of the things I really like about product management is that, um, so in my view, there are a bunch of things that every good product manager needs to be able to do, but right? they need to understand basically what's going on. In their product, with their users, they need to be able to prioritize, they need to be able to um, articulate the roadmap, they need to, be able to be able, need to be able to communicate effectively um, across teams, etc., etc. Um, and there's actually a really good forum post on this, um, which I can send out. Uh, 
Uh, but the really cool thing I, I think about the world is that even though there are things that everyone, every product manager in my, my view needs to uh, be good at, um, it, the role gives people an opportunity to bring their specific skill to the table. Um, and that's what Mariano was talking about, the one percent skill. So I, I think of it as what is the uh, skill that separates you from the 99% of your peers? Like what are you really, really good at? Um, and what I find is that, um, and this is probably applies not only to product management, but more broadly to people's careers, is that um, people have natural interests, right? And you end up being good at what you're naturally interested in. Um, and the way I apply that idea to product management is to figure out what that natural interest is and develop that in your role over a long period of time, right? So. Um, I really like working with data, right? So, um, you know, ever since my first job, I was always like the annoying person that asked, oh, well, do we really have enough data to substantiate this claim or what additional data do we need um, to figure out where we need to go? Um, and that's been consistently an area that I've leaned into in my career, right? That's what I've developed as uh, one of my 1% skills. Um, so, you know, for the team, what I encourage them to do is to find out what that 1% skill is um, and then map that to the job. Because that's ultimately what I think is a great product manager, is a combination of, um, you know, having that base core level of skills plus having a couple of uh, skills that really distinguish. I want to, I think we have five minutes left. We'll take your, your last question first, and then I want to end on a question for the audience.
Yeah, uh, I should bring my own. Um, <laughs> we, product management isn't just a job at the foundation. Like MediaWiki is an open source project. Wikipedia and all of our other projects are open communities. And if you think you've got some idea of what a product manager does for a, uh, a developer or a designer in the community, then, and you have an idea, you can be the person who pushes that product, that idea forward. Um, if you work with like a gadget developer or a volunteer designer, ask the advice of people at the foundation who work on this thing, and you don't have to act, wait for us to build something for you. Good, because it's not going to get through code if you were honest. Thank you.